Hello everyone, my name is Ian and you're watching Big Rock Media. About a week ago I published a video on why I think the KLR, the redesigned one for 2022, is going to be such a big success. Your reaction to that video was mixed. A lot of you thought that the redesign was really great and that Kawasaki is going to sell a lot of those bikes at that price point. But other people really emphasized that they thought Kawasaki didn't do enough to update the bike to keep it relevant with all the modern competition. So today I want to take just a few moments and discuss five things that I've identified that I think are really big problems for the new Kawasaki KLR650 for 2022. So before we go any further, I'm not trying to make this a negative video about the KLR. I love KLRs. If you guys have watched my videos before, you know that I've had like six KLRs in my past and I really respect the bike for what it does. So this is not meant to be a negative thing, it's just saying, look, here's some issues that all of us as riders of KLRs and adventure bikes have really identified and that we think that Kawasaki is really going to struggle with in trying to sell this bike. And if you watched my video last week, you know I actually am really positive about this bike and I think it's important and we'll get to why. But let's jump in and start to talk about these five things that I think Kawasaki has a problem with. So problem number one is a lack of a button to disable the ABS. So as far as all of us can tell, a lot of us have looked into this, we've looked at the photos, we've read the press materials, and it seems like if you get the KLR with the ABS, um, you can get it without ABS by the way, which is great that they're offering that, but if you get the ABS bike, there doesn't seem to be a switch to be able to deactivate the system. Now here's why this is such a problem. If any of you have ridden off-road on an adventure bike or any motorcycle with ABS that you couldn't shut off, you know just how dangerous it is on a loose dirt or especially a gravel surface if you try to come to a stop with that ABS engaged. What happens is the bike senses the slipping and it really uh, pumps the ABS pump but doesn't really give you much stopping power. Now it is true that ABS systems have evolved greatly and they're much more uh, adaptable to dirt and gravel surfaces than they were 10 years ago but pretty much every adventure bike out there these days that has ABS has a way to turn off the ABS, at least to the back wheel. Some systems will allow you to go into an off-road ABS mode where you can turn the ABS off um, on the back and it leaves it on the front, which is a setting that I'm really fond of and I use on my bikes. But the fact that Kawasaki hasn't given us a switch to turn the ABS off is a really, really big problem. And what it's going to mean is that if you buy the ABS bike and you plan to go on dirt roads, which I think most people probably will, otherwise why would you buy a KLR, you're going to have to wire up some sort of a switch um, on your own to turn the ABS off. You might be able to like go and pull a fuse or something like that, but I think the best solution is going to be to wire in just a simple on-off switch to the handlebars, which is going to require some custom work. Now this reminds me back when I bought a Yamaha Super Tenere, I think it was 2011 or 12, somewhere in 2013 maybe, and that bike also at the time, they fixed this now, but back then that didn't come with an ABS off switch, so um, I found that you could wire in a switch to the ABS circuit and simply just turn it off, um, which is something that I ended up doing. So if I'm wrong about this, if anyone from Kawasaki is watching or if anyone knows more, if I'm wrong and there is actually a way to press a button and turn the ABS off, then please let me know because I'd like to correct the video. But if I'm right, that's a real big oversight and I can't understand why Kawasaki wouldn't even think to do that. Okay, so problem number two is that they took away our tachometer. So after I published the video, I was talking with my friend Brandon, who's also had like five or six KLRs like me, and we grew up riding together here in Southern California. And we were looking at the photos and some of the press videos together, and we realized that the dashboard, the screen, the little LCD screen that they give you now, which actually is a, is a pretty good looking little screen, uh, doesn't have a tachometer on it. So they took away the tech, and a lot of you in the comments also noticed this. The LCD does have a lot of useful information. It's got a nice big speedometer. You get a fuel gauge now, which you never got on the KLR before, so that's great. You get some different readouts. But the fact that they didn't even give you like a little bar graph or a little digital tack like some bikes have is, is another big oversight. Now, we don't expect to have like a fully functional TFT display on a bike at this price point, although I should point out that the KTM 390 Adventure, which actually costs less than the KLR, has a full color TFT display. It also has switchable ABS, but you know we'll get to that later in another video. A tachometer is really useful and really important because it lets you do things like set your idle speed. Uh, when you're cruising down the highway, you can see how hard your engine is working, um, how close you are to redline. Uh, when you're riding really, really aggressively, you can see, okay, uh, where your shift points are. And yeah, a lot of you old timers will say, well, 
you know, you can just hear the engine. You don't really need to see the RPM on the graph or on the ta on the display. But I kind of disagree. I really think that for a bike that's going to be ridden mostly on the street and do a lot of touring and, and street riding, that a tachometer is important and it needs to have a tachometer. I, I understand, you know, Honda XRs from 1992 didn't have tachometers. That's fine. But the fact is the KLR, when it came out in even 1984, when they brought out the KLR 600, and I know this because I own one, that bike had a tachometer on it. And it was a big deal because the other bikes at the time didn't have that. And when they brought the KLR 650 out in 1987, um, all the way up till that ended in 2018 on the second gen, they always had a tachometer. So the fact that they took it away is really kind of strange. All right, so problem number three with the KLR is the weight, but more specifically, the power to weight ratio. So the standard bike, if you get the normal KLR 2022 without ABS, is 456 pounds wet. And we can estimate that it makes probably around, from what we know, probably around 45 horsepower at the crank. And that might even be a little generous, but we're not quite sure yet because no one has this bike to put on a dyno. So if we calculate the power to weight ratio for the bike, which will allow us to compare it to other bikes, uh, you get a ratio of 0.1, meaning it has 0.1 horsepower for every pound of weight. Now that's not very meaningful unless we compare it to something else. So let's do that right now. So a lot of people want to compare the KLR to the Tenere 700, which is a little bit unfair because the Tenere costs 50% more, but let's just go ahead with that for now. So if we calculate the power to weight ratio on that bike, so that bike has about 75 horsepower and it weighs about the same as the KLR, real close. So if we calculate that, it's 0.16. So it has 0.16 horsepower for every pound. Now that's over 50% better than a KLR. So essentially what I'm saying is that the Tenere weighs the same, but it has 50% more horsepower. So obviously the KLR by, by comparison is gonna feel like a total slug. Now I can already hear a lot of you saying, well, it's unfair because the Tenere costs more. Okay, well, how about this? The KTM 390 Adventure, which you can go out and buy, I think it's like $6,200. It's one of the best values on adventure bikes out there in my opinion. That bike has around 44 horsepower at the crank. KTM is known for kind of high performance engines and so even with their 400cc engine, it, it revs real high and they're able to put out um, pretty similar horsepower to what a KLR can make. And yes, it's true that it doesn't make as much torque and that's gonna be a limiting factor for some people. But putting aside the torque for a minute, let's stick to the horsepower. So that bike weighs 379 pounds, so quite a bit less than the KLR. So if we do the math, what we find is that it has a power to weight ratio of about 0.12. So even that bike is 20 to 30 percent uh, more powerful for its weight than a KLR 650. And so what I'm getting at here is that anything you compare the KLR to, um, based on how heavy it is, anything else is going to feel faster. It's going to have more power for the weight that it carries. So it, you really do have a problem here with a heavy bike with very low horsepower. Some people are going to be fine with that because you're still getting, you know, for seven grand, pretty much a capable uh, adventure touring bike out off the showroom floor for seven grand that has what you need. But still, I think this is going to be a deal breaker for a lot of people. Now talking about that 390 Adventure, uh, stay tuned and subscribe if you haven't because I'm going to be doing a video comparing the KLR650 to the 390 in terms of all its specs and features and sort of a buyer's guide between those two because I actually think when I looked at it more that that 390 is more of a cross shop with the KLR than some of the more expensive bikes that people have mentioned like the 700 Tenere. The 390 has a TFT dash, it has traction control settings, it has defeatable ABS, it has similar power, it's less weight. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be, I think, something that a lot of people cross shop. All right, so problem number four, this is going to be kind of a quick one to cover, but they decided to stick with the five-speed gearbox. Now, on the one hand, I can understand they're trying to save cost, they're trying not to have to invest a ton of money in developing a new transmission or whatever they have to do, um, so I get that. And I also get that the KLR is a pretty torquey motor, so maybe you can get away without six gears. But here's the thing about having six speeds. If Kawasaki had put six speeds in it, they could have made first gear lower, which the KLR has always had way too high of a first gear for serious off-road work. And then they could have made fit, uh, six gear, uh, more of an overdrive, more of a cruising gear for the highway, so you weren't so revved out at 70, 75. I think of those two things, that lower first gear is actually more valuable because the KLR never felt too strained at 70 or 75, but it definitely needed a lower gear for the dirt. So the fact that they have not given you a six speed is really kind of a huge omission. And all of its competitors have six speeds. Even that 390 Adventure I just talked about, that's a six speed gearbox. So my last point, point number five for the problem with the new KLR is simply this, it's the competition. 
You see, back in 1987, when the KLR650 first came out, it was pretty incredible. And, and don't laugh, I know it's, it sounds like I'm being facetious, but I'm actually not. I mean, the bike had liquid cooling, it had electric star, it had a pretty modern um, you know, unitrack suspension, uh, you had a tachometer, a full gauge cluster, you had a fairing, you had a comfortable seat, you had a large gas tank. All the things that the competitors at the time, like the Honda XR and the Suzuki DR and, and bikes like that, um, couldn't offer you. And so for the money, it was, a, it was a great bike and it was really sort of high tech. It was a double overhead uh, camshaft engine. So it was a great bike in 1987 to come out with those features at that price and a lot, allowed a lot of people to go adventure touring before adventure touring was really the, the sort of the fad that it is today. But here's the problem. It's 2021 and adventure touring has become a huge fad, a huge craze that's taken over the motorcycle world. And so the KLR has to compete with bikes like the Royal Enfield Himalayan. It has to compete with the 390 Adventure. Um, what about the Honda CB500X, especially now that it has a 19 inch front wheel and more suspension travel? So it has really stiff competition. I could also mention things like even the, even the BMW um, G310GS if I want to. So time has moved on and, and the KLR has sort of been left in the past. And I, I don't think that Kawasaki has, has done quite enough to sort of keep it up to date with all those other competitive bikes. I mean, yes, they did give the bike fuel injection, they give it a better headlight, uh, and they gave it like a better dash, but that's not really quite enough to sway you away from some of those other uh, more modernized bikes. Their decision also to sort of uh, not cut the weight and keep the weight really high and actually gained a lot of weight and still keep the power kind of at the same level because they're essentially using the same engine, although it does have EFI, I think that's really gonna hurt them. Uh, because like we talked about the power to weight ratio, you can get a lot of bikes for the same money or less money that have a better power to weight ratio that are gonna perform better, uh, feel faster, more sporty or more agile. And I think that's a real problem for Kawasaki. So those are the five things I've identified, but what do you all think out there? Let me know down below in the comments what you think the main problems are with the KLR, and if you think that it can still be competitive and still sell a lot of bikes despite all these things that I've said. Also, let me know what would be your choice in this sort of five to $8,000 adventure bike range. Would you maybe get a Himalayan? Would you get a 390 Adventure? Would you get the CB500X? Or would you maybe look at getting a new KLR? Let me know down below and let's have a discussion about it. I hope this video was helpful. I hope it sparked some interesting dialogue. Thank you guys for your support, for watching, for subscribing, for hitting the thumbs up button. That really helps. And remember, my channel is unsponsored, so the only way I keep going is through AdSense revenue, so please let some of the ads run. Please hit the thumbs up on every video. Subscribe. Thanks again so much for watching. Stay tuned for more motorcycle videos, and we'll see you out on the trail.